Hello, welcome to Pet Sitter Confessional, an open and honest discussion about life as a pet sitter. Thank you to our sponsor today, Pet Sitters Associates, and our wonderful Patreon supporters. Like Mary, Annabelle, Brandy, Lizzie, Jan, Catherine, Julie, Barbie, Potty Wagon, Erica, and Anna. Thank you very much for your financial contribution to the show. Thank you for finding value in what we do. We really appreciate it. If you would like to learn more about what that means um, and to be a Patreon member, you can go to PetsitterConfessional.com slash support. A few weeks ago, we did a book giveaway with Arden Moore, and we wanted you guys to submit your best dog walking and pet sitting tips to be entered into the drawing. We had a ton of responses, and so today we wanted to share a lot of those. <laughs> well, all of them, basically. This is a listener feedback episode full of amazing tips. So break out your pen and paper. The first category is all about cats. Sarah Ripley said, hi, I'm entering the giveaway with this tip. Give elusive cats their space. Talk out loud in a friendly voice and use their name, but let them decide when they want to come out to meet you. So for example, hi, Fluffy, I came to see you. Let's get you some dinner. She said, I always do this while I go about my tasks and have had several scary cats come sit on my lap while their owners swore they probably won't come out. And I think we've had this, too. Of <laughs> The more that you talk to a cat, they are more likely to be friendly. I, I like being very vocal during my visits anyway. And so just getting them used to your voice, talking in a soothing manner, directing them. That way, they're never surprised about where you are in the house. They can always keep an ear, literally, out for where you are. And it just helps build that rapport and build that trust with them. Blakely wrote in and said, this is my number one pet sitting tip for cats. I always bring treats, catnip, and a laser pen when I do cat visits. When it's my first time alone with them, I put treats next to me and read a book and ignore them until they come up to me. I slowly build the relationship and have had success with anxious and shy cats. I've been known to be the cat whisperer because I get on the floor with them and let them approach me first. My secret weapon is a laser pen, catnip, and a brush. It is true that a lot of times cats just need time and space. Yes, you can entice them with treats and a laser pen, but ultimately sometimes they just need time. Michelle from Lean On Me Pet Sitting said, hmm, best dog walking or pet sitting tip. Well, for her dog walking tip, she said, don't forget poop bags and know the dog's triggers, if any, so you are prepared. And then for cat or pet sitting, she said, let the pet come to you if they are scared. Always keep an eye out for their body language when pet sitting. And that is super important. Body language is key. So you know exactly what the pet is feeling, thinking, and how you need to respond to them. But that takes being observant and giving them that space and wondering, okay, are they neutral? Are they more aggressive? Are they fearful right now? Are they playful? And really, I think what you keyed in there, Megan, is going, okay, now that I know their body language, the next thing for me is, what do I do about that? Do I need to step back? Can I step in? Can I get something else and change the situation for them? The second category is all about being prepared. Brittany Coles said, my number one tip for dog walking is to to always be prepared. Anything could happen at any given time, and the last thing you want to be is surprised. Whether it involves the weather, the safety, and the health of the pet, or the environment, always be prepared and vigilant. Always have a fanny pack of some sort to carry essentials. Keith also has something along the similar lines where he said, be prepared is his number one tip. Pets are as varied as people shape, size, personality, have a variety of tools available to be able to properly and comfortably handle all those personalities, be it a long slip lead, double-handed leash, a collar, or even just spare collars, God forbid one breaks because of a puller. Well, and I think that's why sometimes our cars get so messy because we <laughs> we have all of this equipment and backup equipment and things that we, you know, used that one time that we may need again in the future. Yeah, whether that's extra leashes or harnesses, or maybe that's an extra litter scoop for a cat or an extra baggie for something, you really never know what you need until you are in that situation when you need it. So having things on hand in your car is a great thing, or a backpack if you're walking everywhere. Having a few essentials on hand will really be a great way to help make sure that you are prepared. Another pet sitting tip is by Alicia from Pet Care by Leash wrote in and said, my number one pet sitting tip is to always have a list of several emergency contacts for the pets you are watching. This could be a family member, neighbor, or trusted friend that can help you out in the event of an emergency or any issue that comes up while the owners are away. It is better to have multiple contacts in case one or more can't be reached or are not able to help. It may seem like common sense, but it can save a lot of time in a true emergency and you'll thank yourself for having back. Backups. I will say when they give you that emergency contact, triple check that it is a local person that is not 
traveling with them. I cannot tell you the number of times uh, a spouse will give their spouse's contact information or their child's information who is also traveling with them. And so clarifying that at the meet and greet over the phone to get that and make sure that this person is not traveling and is also local. Well, and a lot of times for us, though, they would actually have put themselves of like, of course, I'm the emergency contact. Yes. Of course, you're going to call me if something is wrong. And we had to clarify on our meet and greet questionnaire of not yourself. I had to put in parentheses, emer- you know, emergency local contact, in parentheses, not yourself. <laughs> Nancy wrote in and said, my personal tip as it snows heavy outside is check the weather and dress for the job. That includes your canine clients. And I think that's important because a lot of times we think about ourselves, you know, if it's snowing, obviously we're going to put a coat on, but it's also the pet as well. Do they need little booties? Do they need a coat? How can we best help them when the weather is not good? And it's not just for their comfort too. It's also for the client's home. So we've been going through a spat of intense rain events in our local area and having a dog with a raincoat really makes cleanup after the fact a lot easier. So they're not bringing in a lot of wet, a lot of water, a lot of mud back into the client's home when you're done with the walk. So there's a lot of benefits that come from that. Melissa Phillips said, pay attention to every little detail. And that's a simple tip, but it's super important because (laughs) especially with pet sitting visits, you have a lot more to care for than just the pet. It's the home too. And similarly, Jewel shared, my number one tip is always be looking out for changes in the dog or cat's behavior and energy level. You may be able to find out about a potential sickness and tell the owner and save them a lot of trouble and possibly the life of their pet. An energy level is huge, whether they are normally really playful and you come in and they are really dragging and they're barely able to get excited. Or maybe they're pretty low energy a lot of times and you come in and they're really super amped up and hyped up. It's our job to figure out why? And maybe all we can do is just clue the client into, hey, Dax is usually really excited when I come in today and he was barely lifting his head up whenever I came in. I think you should get him taken to the vet or maybe that's something that you could offer to do if you have that time. Tracy from The Positive Pet Sitter said, thanks for doing this. I'm a fan of Arden Moore. Love the work she did with the cat behavior fetch find training. My number one pet sitting tip is always, always take a moment or two to take a deep breath and center, focus, relax before walking into any home or pet sitting situation. Keep each pet sit fresh and mindful. Kelsey had a similar thought of my number one dog walking tip is to remain calm and confident. I take a few deep breaths before I start each walk so I can lead my dogs by example with my own calm energy. That is crucial because dogs and pets in general, they feed off of human interaction, human energy and emotions. And so we need to be as calm and collected as possible. So we're not going into a pet sit or a dog walk super frantic, super hyped up because they're going to notice that. And not just that, if we come in amped up, thinking distracted about the red light that we hit or the coffee that we spilled or how late we're running, we are going to miss things. We're going to miss the little details. We're going to forget to latch the back door. We're going to forget to scoop out the litter an extra bit that we need to do. So between missing details and then throwing off the energy of the entire visit, then you end up, it ends up compounding from visit after visit after visit because they don't seem to go right. So taking just two minutes to calm yourself down, 10 breaths in, 10 breaths out, is is going to really help make sure that you are focused and intentionally looking at this visit and being present at that time. Rochelle said, treat every visit as if it's the first or last. Mm. By treating it as if it's a first, you don't miss cues that the dog is having an off day, like you just mentioned, Colin, and may not react as friendly as usual. Maybe it's the thunder or the garbage truck, and you don't skip steps because you're in a habit. It's very easy to go on autopilot some days. (laughs) But treating every visit like it's the last before the owner comes home ensures if they do come home early that they're not met with things out of order and you being embarrassed for how they found the place. I really like this tip because it brings together a lot of different facets of you cannot become have have visits become a habit, especially if they're daily dog walks or if there's somebody who travels for a long time and it's the 17th, it's the 25th visit of the, the trip and you are just on route memory right now and you're not even really you're on autopilot that's a 
pretty dangerous place to be. It's it's low stakes uh, because you are used to all of the movements that you have to be, but you're not mentally present in the moment and you are going to miss things. And then the treat every visit like it's your last is going to help make sure that it's always done and you always need to be prepared for things to come in. I know we usually start preparing like the third to last visit, just making sure everything's taken care of and really dialed in. But again, you never know when somebody may return home. We also got a few tips about software. So Shannon Rigby said, my number one tip would be to use software like Time to Pet. It organizes so much for the business owner and presents a professional image to the client. I waited far too long to finally sign up. And when I did, it completely changed the trajectory of my business. Rosie agrees. She said, I love the podcast and have learned so much from you guys. My number one tip is to have pet sitting software. Even if you have a small operation or solo, pet sitting software is a must. Thanks for all you do. Absolutely. Small, big scale, solo, everything in between. Software is a great way to make sure that you never miss visits. I know we have clients who text us and it absolutely terrifies me anymore when they text us something or a phone call and going, something is going to fall through the cracks if I don't absolutely take care of this. And then that way, when something does happen, you are not to blame whenever the client misbooked themselves in the visit. They didn't book as many or they didn't book early or they didn't go long enough. It's not on you at that point. And you can always ask clarifying questions, but it's a great way to make sure that you don't have to worry about missing something because it's on the clients to take care of it. Yvonne Rosenberger said, keep the key and your phone on your body. She put that in capital letters, on your body. If left on a table, you would be locked out and have no phone. And being locked out is probably one of the scariest things that we can have happen to us, especially if you don't have your phone on you. To and, then... and it's 10 o'clock at night and you don't want to go knock on neighbor's doors <laughs> so that you can use their phone. But that may be what you have to do in that situation. So having a lanyard on your on your around your neck or having a big keychain that you have clipped to your belt or clipped to your waistband whatever that is making sure that you have these essentials on you and doing a triple check before you go outside even into the backyard making sure that you have these essentials on you will help make sure that you don't get locked out we got a ton of tips about dog walks olivia hansen said here's my number one dog walking tip i always carry two extra rolls of poo bags. After using my last poo bag on a walk and a dog decided to poo right in front of someone's house and I didn't have a bag, (laughs) she didn't have a bag, I knew immediately I needed to carry extra bags. Ann Chipman had another poop bag tip. She said, always have a wrinkled up poop bag in your pocket before starting the walk so you're ready to pick up and go. I know whenever I train our staff, this is one of the very first things that I demonstrate to them before we go on a walk for the very first visit. I always say, here's a pro tip. Take it rip it out and crinkle it up so that you're not having to send because it could be raining it could be windy it could be freezing and you're out there trying to open up this little plastic tiny bag and the dog is ready to go and you're wasting your time and you get really frustrated and you end up just picking up the poop from the side of the bag and it's not actually in the bag avoid all of that before you go outside wrinkle it up put it in your in your pocket it will save you so much time and then having not just having one poop bag having multiples on you always have backups there's no reason not to with coats and pockets and that's how we end up with them multiplying throughout all of our lives and being every corner of our house <laughs> Brittany's dog walking tip is to always make sure you have a good grip on the leash. Make sure your hand is through the loop and you have a hand along the shaft for control as well as safety. So we got lots of leash feedback tips. Donna said, I have a long dog leash around my waist, so I have my hands free. Lisa said, I always keep a variety of types and sizes of leashes and collars in my vehicle. The leashes and collars my clients use are not always the best type or fit for their particular dog. So I carry my favorites for temperaments, for sizes, length, comfort, etc. And after sending my clients pictures and videos, they invariably end up (laughs) asking me about them and why I use them. That gives me an opportunity to educate them as to the correct leashes and collars for their dog. It has often been a game changer for my clients when it comes to walking their own dogs. Two points of contact on the leash at all times, regardless of whatever you're doing, will make sure that there's no possibility of that dog slipping out of your hand. The last thing you want to be doing is having that leash dangling with your fingers. And I know many of us train dogs to loose leash walk next to us, and they're not constantly pulling. But at the end of the day, it's our responsibility 
to make sure that that dog does not get away. So having the loop around the wrist, taking that same hand, clamping it on the on the leash, and then going down the shaft of that leash and clamping it with your other hand, two points of contact. Actually, that's three around your wrist and then one in both hands. That way, if you have to take a hand off to take a photo, send a text, could update, you can pick go up poop. pick up poop is the big one here. <laughs> and then making sure that the gear that you're using is appropriate for the dog that you are walking. Many clients have no idea what it does and what it means to have a well-fitted harness or a good-fitting collar. So sometimes you have to supplement your own on top of that and then additionally educate them so that they can be living a good life with their pet in a safe and secure way. And then similar to these leash tips, Jane Torek has a tip about gear. She says, I love your interview with the amazing Ardmore. I know we did too. And here's her tip about dog walking. Invest in good gear. Having comfortable shoes, updating them when they get worn will make walking so much more comfortable. I found that my feet and knees would hurt if my shoes didn't offer enough support or cushion. I pay a little extra for good shoes and a good arch support insole. Plus, my car trunk is filled with lots of gear for whatever weather may impact my day. Extra hat, gloves gloves, coats, polar fleece, or sweaters of different warmth levels for temperature changes, a good raincoat, hat, pants, plus waterproof boots for wet weather, an extra change of clothes and shoes for whatever may happen. Investing in good gear that is going to not just last for a couple days while you're out walking and taking care of pets, but that will last for years and years to come will not only save you money, but also make sure that you are more comfortable while you're out doing these visits. Lori said that her number one tip for dog walking is to be prepared for anything. We use tiny horse waist and crossbody leashes in case we fall so we don't accidentally drop a leash and also so we can be hands-free in case of an off-leash dog. To take photos, also it's good, and to pick up after the dogs. I carry around a mini first aid kit in my waist pack, extra poop bags, a slip lead, and plenty of dog treats. We're about to interview Taylor Leadall again from Tiny Horse in a few weeks, and she is just, her products are just amazing. We love them. (laughs) Again, high quality products. Yes, do they cost a little bit more than the stuff that you can get from the big box retail stores? Yes, they do. Are they going to last for multiple years to come and be consistent and reliable every time they use them? Also, yes. And so you have to understand if this is a profession, investing in good gears and good tools will really help you. Martha McSim said, I love doing enrichment activities on the walks, even a sniffari. I will sometimes take a toilet paper roll, put treats in it, and have a dog find it under a tree. She'll also place treats on a big rock or a tree and have the dog wait and break for the treats. This is a great way to add something extra for the walk. Many times you might not have a good place to walk the dog for 30 minutes or an hour long straight and you feel kind of silly walking in the same small circle over and over and over and over again. Or it's bad weather and you can't go outside (laughs) because it's negative four degrees. Or maybe the dog is not feeling it that day and isn't wanting to feel active. Or maybe the dog's on different medication or it's an older dog or for whatever reason, you can take that walk and add a little activity like this in the middle of it to break it up, give it, not make it so monotonous. Or maybe this is done during the, the, the break period where you're kind of resting and you're giving them a little bit of a water break. Adding a little, a little activity like this really takes that, that walk and bumps it up several notches. One of our great dog walking and pet sitting tips is to have insurance. As pet care professionals, your clients trust you to care for their furry family members. And that's why Petsters Associates is here to help. For over 20 years, they have provided thousands of members with quality pet care insurance. Because you work in the pet care industry, you can take your career to the next level with flexible coverage options, client connections, and complete freedom in running your business. Learn why Petsitters Associates is the perfect fit for you and get a free quote at petsitllc.com. You can get a discount when joining by clicking Membership Petsitter Confessional and use the discount code CONFESSIONAL when you go to checkout. Check out the benefits of membership and insurance once again at petsitllc.com. The next category of responses are really focused around the client experience and customer service. Kendall said, take cute pics of your client's pets. This not only provides reassurance to your client that their pet is happy and in good hands, but it provides you with future content for your business with client permission, of course. Definitely get that photo release form signed by your client before you start posting them over social media. Many clients might not be comfortable with that and may ask additional questions about how you will use that photo, when you will use that photo, have that part of the contract and onboarding process so that they know what to expect. And then take time to really take those photos. (laughs) Really invest 
effort into learning how to operate your cell phone optimally in all sorts of conditions. And I know we've done several episodes on taking good, high quality photos with your camera. And so that really helps set you apart and make sure that that when their clients can share that through social media, it's worthwhile to them and it will be a cherished memory of theirs for years to come. Well, and if they love the photo enough to share it out, they're going to elevate your business without you having to really do a lot of work. Right. Lisa said, my best pet sitting and dog walking tip is to have great communication with your client, the pet owner, to learn about the pets and do a meet and greet ahead of time to meet the pets so you have a relationship established from the beginning. This really is a relationship business. Mm. And so that meet and greet is crucial to get to know them, for them to get to know you and make sure that it's going to be a fit for both parties. Well, we talk about communication leading up to that meet and greet, but the communication must continue at a high level for the duration of that relationship. The only way to deepen and grow a trust in a relationship is to maintain high levels of communication and back and forth. So always remembering it's our job to communicate to the client. Sophia also thinks communication is super important. She oh. said, my best pet sitting tip is to communicate to pet parents how hard we work to keep their pets safe, happy, and comfortable. The pets can't report back, so the only way pet parents know exactly how detail-oriented and passionate we are is if we communicate that to them in our pet care reports. This has been a significant part of my value add as a pet care professional. Mm-hmm. I work hard for my clients, and it's important that they understand what excellent pet care looks like and that they know they're receiving it from me. This, I, yes, absolutely. absolutely. The clients are going to tell you what they want done in their home. And then you have to tell them what you did in their home. Even as though it's going to be very simple sometimes, you may not feel like, oh, do I really need to take that photo of the clean litter box? Do I really need to take the photo of the food that I added? The answer is yes and yes, and it's always yes. You have to both show, you have to both tell them and then show the clients what you're doing. Because even though they have cameras and they can see everything, it means something completely different when you are the one sharing and reporting back to them, other than them kind of having a bird's eye view of you wandering around their home. It's a completely different kind of interaction. Well, and if they wanted three mils of a medication to Fluffy and their brown package brought in from the porch, then you need to say, okay, Fluffy was given three mils of this medication and the brown pack, here's the picture of the brown package out from the inside and on the porch. Well, and that's a change that we've made recently as far as reporting medications. We used to say meds given at the PM visit, but we've changed that to report specifically what what medications were given and the amounts that they were given because sometimes clients were confused about what was going on and it was just a great way to give them reassurance that we had everything under control. Lynn had a few tips. She said, always have an extra leash in the car. Always make sure the collar or harness is not loose before walking a dog. Always dress for the weather. But probably the number one pet sitting tip would be honesty is the best policy. And that is certainly true because like you mentioned, clients have cameras everywhere, inside, outside, everywhere in between. And so if you don't do something or you do do something, they're going to know about it. The last group of responses were all about setting boundaries. Jen said, my number one tip for pet sitters is knowing it's okay not to accept every client and that you should schedule vacation or downtime every month to give you a day at home to do errands, sleep, chores, or nothing at all if you want. That time really helps you not only take a step back from your business and readjust and reset, but also gives you a dedicated time to get caught back up on everything else going on in your life. When we're running sun up to sun down seven days a week, doing things like getting an oil change, getting a haircut, going grocery shopping, all those basic life necessities all of a sudden become really hard to do. So scheduling that time ahead of time and then sticking to it will make sure those other life things don't fall through the cracks. Lauren said, have a clear, concise contract so pet owners and yourself are on the same page about care and the cost and other important factors in pet sitting. This is crucial. We did not have a contract 11 years ago when we started this, and I'm kicking myself because it really does protect your business. And it we, we do have to explain to clients sometimes of like, this is not locking you into anything. This is simply, you know, a terms of service of yeah. this is how we operate. And we want you to know this information before the meet and greet. I mean, basically, so we're not wasting anybody's time. <laughs> <laughs> and you can decide how you want to present this information. We have definitely fallen back, fallen to it's a term of service because because it's our our terms of service does not have 
the dates, does not have payment information, does not have that kind of stuff specific for that client and their booking. The the booking is handed separately. The terms of service is just how we operate. And we want our clients to sign that before we even show up. It gives them a time to review everything and make sure they're okay with things like our cancellation policy. Because if they're not, we are not a good fit. And we need to communicate that up front and be honest about that so that they can make an informed decision about working with us or not. Morgan Wilson wrote in and said she's an avid listener of the podcast. I run a babysitting and pet sitting business called The Cuddly Cactus, located in southwest Louisiana. I love that name. (laughs) (laughs) My number one tip is to not let the client walk over you. So many times I've wanted to make clients happy that I've given in to their every request. I noticed every time I've sat for those clients, I was dreading the job and ready for them to return. I now only take up clients that are truly thankful for what I do and respect me as a person. This is a wonderful tip because in this industry, it can be so easy to say yes to every single person, every single request, no matter if it's draining on you or you enjoy it. It's just come one, come all, basically. But ultimately, that is going to lead to burnout. And so knowing yourself and what you want to take on and what you don't want to take on is very important. Yeah, and those clients that just take advantage of you because they think they can walk over you. And then you get that request that comes through your software, they call you and you just go, oh, not again. I don't. You start dreading it. And what this does is these, these little micro fatigues, these micro stressors that come into your life of now you're not just, you know, maybe you enjoy the dog, but the the anxiety that this fills you with of working with this client again is something that just can consumes you and hangs over you the entire visit. So you can't be present and actually enjoy the work that you love to do. Well, and because of all the pandemic puppies, the dog moms and dog dads have kind of become helicopter parents. And maybe they're wanting more updates a day than you can provide or want to provide, or they're just having little things here and there of, oh, can you do this? Can you do this? And you just don't want to. Right. It can be very easy to fall into that, but knowing your boundaries and saying, no, I'm not doing that. (laughs) And then Sandy says, trust your gut. I do mainly dog care, but have a few kitty clients as well. I've been in business since 2013. I worked as an IC for another pet sitting company for seven years before that. My number one tip for pet sitting is listen to your gut on the meet and greet and ask questions even if they aren't comfortable. Mm. If your gut tells you this isn't a good fit or something seems off, listen, it's okay to turn down a sit. So she has two examples here. The first one is, I interviewed for an overnight for a pocket bully, and the wife was obviously afraid of the dog. She stood as far away from the dog as she could when I met them, and the dog kept jumping on me and scratching my legs. On my first visit, the dog blocked me in a bedroom, showed aggression, and I had to use my wits to exit the house safely. I had to contact the neighbor to take over. He was the emergency contact and had cared for the dog many times in the past. Only time in almost 20 years I had to walk away from a pet sit. The second, she said, most recent, was an owner kept their small dog on a leash during the entire meet and greet. The reason, I found out after I started the sit, was that the dog barks continuously and tries to bite us every time our back is turned or when we walk by him. I could have avoided both scenarios by asking a few more questions. Why are you afraid of this dog? And why are you keeping your dog on a leash inside the house? One of the earlier tips was to pay attention to every detail. And same thing with the mean greet. If you see the client acting a certain way, moving a certain way, repeating the same words over and over again, ask about it. Collect, you know, write that information down and then be up front because that's important information for you to know and not shy away from that. Like you feel like you're going to hurt their feelings or it may be awkward to ask, hey, why is this gate over here? Or, hey, I see a lot of scratch marks on the back door. Are those recent? How did those get there? I actually just asked a, a, a client about the scratch marks on a door at a very recent meet and greet of going because they hadn't t- mentioned it at all. They were, it was like they didn't exist in the home. And so, towards the end, I said, I noticed that there are some scratch marks on the door over here. Could you please tell me about those? And they said, oh, that was whenever they were a puppy and I just have never gotten around to repairing them. That's much better to find out than than the dog actually has massive separation anxiety that they're trying to hide from you. Well, and she also mentioned trusting your gut, which Mm -hmm. is huge. So in your personal life, you know, where am I going to college? Where, what spouse am I going to marry? What food am I going to eat today? <laughs> you know, tr- <laughs> trusting your gut, both literally and figuratively, but trusting your gut in business is very helpful because sometimes we come away from a meet and greet or we come away from a potential hire and we go, oh, I don't know. I kind of feel a little icky about this. Mm-hmm. 
And so going with your gut on this, I mean, you don't need every single client out there and you don't want to be dreading these visits when they come up or you don't want to be dreading that hire that you just hired because you were a little uneasy, but you were coming from a place of needing to hire because you're so busy. And the only thing that you need to say for either the hire or for the potential client that you're turning down is after further review of your information, we're not a good fit. That's it. And that's the only justification that you need to give and you can move on and continue running your business. So what is your number one tip? These have been wonderful to read through and thank you to everyone who submitted them. But we want to know, are there, I'm sure there are more tips out there. So I think there are. If, <laughs> if you have not submitted one yet, feel free to email us at feedback at petsitterconfessional.com. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you to Pet Sitters Associates and our Patreon members for financially supporting the show each month. We will talk with you next time. Bye. Bye. <laughs>